beyond Voyager 1 and 2 with Interstellar Probe Mission. This video is dedicated to the Interstellar Probe, a robotic space mission being studied by NASA aimed at studying the interstellar medium. But before we talk about it, we will try to explain what the interstellar medium is. The interstellar medium, often abbreviated as ISM from the English interstellar medium, consists of a rather rarefied mixture of ions, atoms, molecules, dust grains, cosmic rays, and magnetic fields. By mass, 99% of the matter is made up of gases, the remaining 1% of dust. Densities range from a few thousand to a few hundred million particles per cubic meter, with an average value in the Milky Way of 1 million particles per cubic meter i.e. one particle per cubic centimeter. As a result of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the interstellar medium gas consists of approximately 89% hydrogen and 9% helium, with 2% heavier elements, termed metals in astronomical jargon, and trace compounds. The interstellar medium plays an important role in astrophysics. Stars, for example, interact in many ways with the interstellar medium. First of all, they form within the densest regions of the ISM, molecular clouds and then shape their structures thanks to their winds, and they modify their composition, enriching it with the heavier elements produced within them. Once they reach the end of their evolution, through the emission of a planetary nebula or the explosion of a supernova, this latter mechanism is at the basis of the production of elements heavier than iron, the last element that can be synthesized in the nucleus of a star. These continuous interactions between stars and ISMs help determine the rate at which a galaxy consumes its gas reserves, and therefore allows us to measure the time in which it undergoes active star formation. All the planets of our solar system are enclosed in a magnetic bubble, the heliosphere, sculpted in space by the constantly outflowing material of the Sun, the solar wind. The heliosphere is that region of space surrounding the Sun in which the density of the solar wind is greater than that of the surrounding interstellar matter. It has the shape of a giant bubble around the sun, not centered on it, continuously inflated by the solar wind, so its boundaries have an irregular shape based on the distribution and intensity of the wind, which in turn depends on solar activity. It has more of a cometary aspect with an elongated tail in the opposite direction to the motion of the sun in the galaxy. The heliosphere provides a shield against cosmic radiation by absorbing much of it in a similar way to the protection offered by planetary magnetospheres against the solar wind. The solar wind blows undisturbed for billions of kilometers, meeting as obstacles only the various celestial bodies and their magnetospheres if they have any, until its motion slows down to subsonic speeds due to the collision with the interstellar medium and the pressure that it exercises. The solar wind is therefore subject to compression and heating. The area of the heliosphere in which this occurs is called termination shock. The outermost region of the heliosphere is called heliosheath and is the transition zone between the termination shock and the heliopause, which represents the outer edge of the heliosphere, beyond which the solar wind stops and the interstellar medium prevails. The heliopause can be considered as one of the boundaries of the solar system, based on the criterion of the influence of the solar wind. Criteria based on solar gravitational attraction are more labile as gravity extends without limits, obviously weakening with distance. It should be noted that the Oort cloud is located beyond the heliopause but is gravitationally linked to the Sun. For lack of precise data, it has not yet been possible to establish the real extent of the heliosphere. Probably it develops up to a minimum of three times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. The inner part of the heliosphere was studied by the Ulysses probe. While analyzing the data transmitted by the Pioneers 10 and 11 and Voyager 1 and 2, which managed to go beyond the orbit of Pluto and go into deep space, to evaluate the extension and the properties in the outermost area. Beyond the heliosphere is the interstellar medium, the ionized gas and magnetic field that fills the space between star systems in our galaxy. For years, scientists have been debating the shape of the heliosphere which has traditionally been given the appearance of an oblong bubble with a rounded head and tail, due to the much stronger interstellar magnetic field than expected. A study published in March 2020 in Nature Astronomy 
provided a new interpretation of the more symmetrical, almost rounded, tailless shape of the heliosphere. But how was it understood that Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 exited the heliosphere and entered interstellar space? Thanks to the data collected by the detectors of energetic particles, while well, the number of low-energy particles of solar origin has definitely dropped, that of the very energetic particles of interstellar origin has increased dramatically and has remained high. This confirmed that the probes had entered a new region of space. Furthermore, the two Voyager probes have confirmed that the plasma in the local interstellar space is much denser than that inside the heliosphere, as expected. Voyager 2 also measured the temperature of nearby interstellar plasma, confirming that it is colder than heliospheric plasma, but with a slightly higher temperature than expected. In 2012, Voyager 1 detected slightly denser plasma than expected just outside the heliosphere, indicating that the plasma is being compressed in some way. The temperature observed by Voyager 2 could also indicate that the plasma is compressed. The external plasma would be even cooler than the internal plasma. In addition, the probe also detected a slight increase in plasma density just before exiting the heliosphere, another index of compression near the inner edge of the solar bubble. But scientists still don't have a model that fully explains what's causing the compression on both sides. Despite numerous and important discoveries, there are still several unanswered questions. 1. What is the global nature of the heliosphere? 2. How do the Sun and the galactic environment influence the dynamics of the heliosphere? 3. What is the nature of the local interstellar medium? What other questions could the interstellar probe answer? Write them in the comments. The Voyagers will probably not be able to answer these questions. Launched more than 40 years ago, their operational vision is now nearing an end both powered by a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. They will still be able to operate until 2025, albeit to a limited extent, after which the batteries will be permanently discharged. For this reason, and in order to answer the questions still open about the interstellar medium, NASA is studying a new interstellar mission called Interstellar Probe. Its scientific objectives will be the following. 1. Explore the impact of the solar system on the interstellar medium as an example of the interaction between a star system and the surrounding environment. 2. Explore the influence of solar activity, the interstellar medium, and its probable inhomogeneities on the dynamics and evolution of the heliosphere as a whole. 3. Explore the interstellar medium and directly determine the properties of interstellar gas, interstellar magnetic field, low energy cosmic rays and interstellar dust. In your opinion, what interesting discoveries could the interstellar probe make? Write it in the comments. Probably the interstellar probe spacecraft will remember the Voyagers or the New Horizons probe in appearance and in some technologies present on board. Due to the very large distance from the sun at which it will find itself, the energy necessary to operate the onboard equipment won't come from solar panels, but from thermoelectric isotope generators similar to those of the Voyager or New Horizons. Furthermore, again like its ancestors, it will mount a large high-gain antenna for communications with the Earth. In addition, the interstellar probe will almost certainly exploit the gravitational sling effect of the planets to receive the thrust necessary to accelerate into interstellar space. Scientists from NASA and the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory have proposed two configurations of the same spacecraft, basic and advanced. Although the appearance of the two configurations is very similar externally, there are some changes in the instrumentation of the spacecraft in the advanced version, aimed at optimizing its field of view. The two basic and advanced configurations have the same navigation and guidance system, and the methods of transmitting data to Earth also appear very similar. Now let's have a look at some of the features present on board the two configurations. In the basic configuration, the spacecraft with a mass of about 860 kilograms will rotate on three axes and will be equipped with a fixed antenna of 5 meters in diameter and 50 meter PW wire antennas. The spacecraft's architecture is typical of deep space missions with redundant systems so that in the event of breakage or malfunctions, the spacecraft's functionality is always guaranteed. In addition to the main antenna, another telecommunications antenna is provided in the X-band. 
The Pro batteries will be powered by two new generation radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Even in the advanced configuration, the spacecraft will be able to rotate on three axes, but changes will be made that will take into account the greater amount of scientific instrumentation that will be installed for this configuration and improvements in the probe's attitude control software. It is believed that throughout the mission there will be times when substantial amounts of data will be poured to Earth, even from distances of 1,000 astronomical units and beyond. Thanks to this data, it will be possible to do a lot of science. The volume of data arriving on Earth will be inversely proportional to the distance traveled by the spacecraft, due to the increasing loss of energy and consequent weakness of the signals. While up to about 10 years after launch, there will be three contacts a week with the Earth to download data. Their number will vary over time. Between 10 and 35 years after launch, there will be only one contact every two weeks. While thereafter, there will be a contact per week to transfer the data to Earth. The spacecraft, once fully operational, will be able to travel at speeds between 7 and 8 astronomical units per year. Since this is a very ambitious mission, the concept study plan was drawn up for its development, which describes the different phases of the mission, from design to the maneuvers to be carried out during its operational life. It is a fundamental document to help engineers and scientists to analyze as many problems as possible that could arise during the mission. In Phase 1, the research group defines the preliminary characteristics of the scientific load, such as the overall dimensions, the energy consumption, the mass of the individual scientific instruments, also by resorting to analogs already available and mock-up models. We also try to identify a series of trajectories optimized to consume the least amount of fuel possible. In Phase 2, in view of the gravitational flyby with Jupiter, it will be necessary to define a mission and a type of spacecraft that adapt to the scientific payload defined in Phase 1. In addition, suitable materials for the heat shield will be developed to protect the spacecraft during the execution of the Oberth maneuver or enhanced flyby. This is a maneuver in which a spacecraft falls into a gravity well and then accelerates as it falls, thus obtaining additional speed. In Phase 3, it will be necessary to study the feasibility of the Solar Oberth Maneuver. Be sure to join the channel, leave us a like and click on the bell. You will help us to make products of even higher quality.